presentation just to show you the technique which we use for the um, scribe's reconstruction. You know, it's very important that you have a reliable closure of the skull base, especially if you make extended approaches. And there are publications of a lot of techniques which can be used. So we try to make it very simple and depending from the degree of CSF leakage we have. When we expect a lesion, you see this is a chordoma patient and we look here, you see there seems to be a dura covering the whole lesion. So this looks to us to be an extradural tumor. When we see this, we don't raise the nasal septal flap. Some people use a nasal septal flap in all surgeries, even small pituitary cases, because they say, mm, it's very reliable, I have a low CSF rate. That's it's probably true. But the harvesting of the flap itself may cause trouble for the nose, discharge, crusting, and this may last for a long time. So if it's not required, we don't use it. So we look to the MRI, we make a judgment. What is the spec CSF leakage? Is a high risk, low risk? It's a high flow leakage, it's a low flow leakage. So from these uh, factors, um, we choose our reconstruction. And we think about it before we start with the surgery, because if you need a flap and you don't raise it in the beginning, you make a standard opening for the sphenoid sinus and you will destroy the pedicle and you cannot have an, a pedicle flap. For example, in this case, you see this is a chordoma, obviously, rising here from the clivus, and you see this is a purely intradural lesion. Then we know, yes, for this we need a flap, so we harvest a flap. So our policy is if we have no CSF flow during the surgery and we do not expect it before, we just put jail foam. If it's a microadenoma, sometimes this is all we do. We don't close the cellar floor. Frequently we, we, we use an artificial um, PDS foliar. This is a foliar. It is used for orbital roof reconstruction by the maxillofacial surgeons. And we use it to close the cellar floor. Sometimes we use bone, but this is rare. If we have during a pituitary surgery minus CSF flow, we take a little bit fat from the periumbilicus area and we glue it with fibrin glue and we take the PDS piece to reconstruct the bony floor. Sometimes we use simply collagen. So, but I think if you take fat, you are on the safe side. But sometimes, um, we are lazy, we take the fat and then we take a little bit of collagen, which might also be okay. If you have a major CSF flow, usually we want to have a nasal septal flap. If we have a high flow leakage, that means we have opened the third ventricle. In craniopharyngioma cases, we use fat, fibrin glue, flap, lumbar drain for five days and we pack the nose. If you have a standard pituitary, usually we don't pack the nose and the patient can breathe freely after the surgery. Some people are concerned about lumbar drain and it is certainly correct. If you have a patient which is not compliant, it's dangerous to use an nasal septal flap. We, for example, had the experience with one lady, we make a reconstruction of the frontal skull base. And this was after resection of an olfactory growth meningioma. It was a recurrent, patient, a recurrent case where the tumor grew into the nose. So there was no cortical cuff over the skull base, but was a big cavity filled with CSF. So we placed everything and we put the lumbar drain, patient stands up and all the reconstruction was falling into the cavity of the, of the, um, the skull. And then she developed brain abscess. So if you have a lumbar drain, you must really take care that it's really um, handled properly. That means the upper limit of the lumbar drain is always in the level of the external auditory canal. So if the patient stands up, he has to elevate it to this level. If he's laying down, you can bring it down again. So just a short, some examples. This is a microadenoma. So you see we open the bony floor in a rectangular fashion, and this distance is longer than the vertical. So the horizontal dimension of this bone which is raised is longer than the vertical one. 
Then we take the whole cellar floor as a single piece. It's a small one millimeter carousel. And you have the cellar exposed, so there was a microadenoma here. So we remove the microadenoma and then to reconstruct the bony floor, we simply bring the bone in and we turn it 90 degrees. So the long axis of this flap is now the uh, vertical axis. And then you have a kind of reconstruction of the bony floor. Many people say it's not necessary, certainly true. We, we uh, not always do it. Sometimes we just cover it with gel foam, but it can be done if you want. This is a resolvable plate. It's made of PDS. You see it's a, it was a PTI noma. We put some gel foam in the cavity, and then we use this polydeoxanone piece. We bring it epidurally. So we try to put it on the dura epidurally, and this keeps our fat or our gel foam inside and it's not falling out. This is quite useful. We use this, this is a technique we use quite frequently. Fat can be used. You see, this was a cardoma case and we had not a nasal septal flap. This is a big defect and you know it's a high risk. So we put one piece of fat into this clavial defect and the second one which is not completely filling the, the sinus, but it's, uh, it's filling the sinus. You see, this was an, a, a cardoma case. And then we put a lumbar drain. And in this patient, we had no problem with CSF leakage, but it can happen. So it's better in these cases you raise the flap. Little septal flap is a good idea. It's not, it's not so new. I, I, I saw a paper from Hirsch. It was in the 1950s. He also raised a flap from the nasal septum, but nobody was recognizing it. And then there was a publication of Haddad and his co-worker in 2006, and they described this big flap where you can take the mucosa from the nasal septum. If you go here, you should keep in mind that the septum, the medial septum, is very important for olfaction. So you should always leave at least one centimeter of the mucosa in this area where you have the olfactory fibers intact. Otherwise, it's a high risk that you lose olfaction. Another structure which is important for olfaction is the super turbinates. So also, these should be preserved if possible. If you take the septum away from here, all this part is denuded from mucosa. So what happens? Crusting. The amount of crusting depends from the amount of bone you leave behind without coverage of mucosa. That's why when we make a standard pituitary case, we just remove the mucosa and the sphenoid sinus from the cellar floor. So we don't pull everything out. Only when you have the flap, then you have to remove all the mucosa. Otherwise, you will create a mucosal if you put the flap on the mucosa. So, but if you have this septum without any mucosa, it takes at least, at least four months. There's a publication showing it takes three months, in our experience, at least four months. And we had one patient, he suffered even after six months from crusting discharge. So it takes a long time. That's why Rick Tarot had a good idea to make a reverse flap. So it means on the other side of the septum, you cut the mucosa in the opposite way. Then you remove, the, you remove the bony part of the septum, so half of the septum is removed, and then you flip the mucosa to the side where you took the flap. So you see, we flip the mucosa on the other side, then we suture the mucosa to the cutting edge where we took the flap, and then you have the septum, most of the part is covered with mucosa, and then the revitalization is much, much faster. And the discomfort of the patient is really less. You will see this if you try this, they do much better. It's a really a nice idea. So one, one example here. We have clival defect. See, this is cellar, carotid, carotid. So you have a big defect. To fill this defect, the best is you use fat. We take fibrin glue, fix it here, and then on this, we use uh, the nasal septal flap. It's very important that all septi, which might be here, are drilled flat. 
that the flat has really a good um, plane to uh, put it on. You see this anesoceptor flap. It should be always in contact. There should not be air in between the flap and the, and the bone. If you have a very deep indentation of the clivus, we take more fat that the flap has a plane to lay on. So it's very bad if it's not in contact. So the flap should be in contact to bone. And we avoid any foreign material. Many people, they use some Duragen or, or surgery cells. They put other things in between the flap and the skull base. We never do this because then I have not a vital tissue. And in my opinion, the, the flap cannot heal as well. So it should really, the flap should lay on the bone. No artificial material in between. And you see, this is the post-op MRI. If, if you see this image with a very good enhancement of the flap, then you know it's a good perfusion and you should have a good healing. And this is a fat suppression MRI. That's why the fat which we placed here is dark. So we usually take a monopolar electrode, we cut here along the coana, then we go down to the floor of the nasal cavity. We go more in front. And then the length of the flap depends from your defect. So usually you go close to the mucocutaneous junction, you expose the cartilage. It's very important that you do not go through. So make no hole in the beginning, then the ENT doctor will shout you because this is not for the nasal not good for the nasal um, anatomy. You see, here we leave at least one centimeter from the skull base, and then we raise the flap. Sometimes we have some bony spurs, and the flap becomes very small. This can happen. And then we cut here along the coana, so that we have a good um, possibility to bring the flap in the position where we want to. So the nasal septal flap is very good. So this is a case where we had a, a radcus cleftus. So there was not much CSF leakage, was no opening of the third ventricular floor. So we did not use fat, we just put gel foam in the dual defect. And then we, we uh, took the flap, positioned it on the, on the uh, skull base, and then we glued it, take fibrin glue. Then usually we put some surgery cell on it, and then gel foam, and then we take tamponades, one, two, three on each side. So patient with a craniopharyngioma, you see the big holes. These are the patients with the highest risk of problems. So we use fat. It's very important that you take care that the fat is not falling down into the third ventricle. That would be a disaster. So the major part of the fat remains outside. We take fibrin glue, and then you see the flap again is put on the skull base. Very important that you have no folding here, that really it is flat on the skull base. We take fibrin glue, then we put surgery cell on it, then we put gel foam. Gel foam is only to prevent that your flap is sticky to the tamponades. If you have for five days a tamponade and you remove it and it's sticky, it may come with a tamponade. That's why we put gel foam and then you can easily remove the tamponades. So some people say with a nasal flap you can decrease the CSF leakage to under 5%. Maybe it's a little bit over uh, op optimistic, but I think it's really a good technique to prevent post-operative CSF leaks. We had two patients with cranial pharyngioma. They presented with hydrocephalus. And these patients continued to have leakage, although we had a nice flap. And finally, they ended up with a shunt, a VP shunt, because the pressure was too high. And then after one year, we removed the shunt from the patient, and, and it was fine. Any questions? Well, Prosy, yes? If you can uh, inform us the complications, what time and uh, what kind of uh, abduction we uh, use the uh, You mean if you have so many men, men in in case of uh, inflammatory uh, disturbances. 
So I don't remember that we had to make a special reconstruction because we had an infection. So you maybe make our instruction, and then if the patient would get meningitis, we just treat with antibiotics, but we would not change the reconstruction. This is only in cases when we have a spontaneous CSF leakage, patient comes in with meningitis, then we close the defect, and then we usually take only autologous material. That means fat, sometimes a flap, local flap, middle terminate flap, or if you have the big defect, we take fascia lata. But we try to avoid to take fascia lata. We don't use it much. More the ENT doctors, they use it more frequently than me because it's causing pain. And, and, uh, and I think it's not frequently necessary if you have the possibility to make a nasal septum flap. But it's no special reconstruction in infection. So if you have a post-operative infection, and I had already my reconstruction, I just treated with antibiotics, so I would not change it again, only if it's not sufficient. If you have a defect and you see CSF is coming, of course, you have, for example, you have to take another piece of fat to glue it there and keep it. Is this your question, yeah? Uh, uh, what uh, time uh, reconstruction and uh, and and, and uh, тяжесть выраженность воспалительных реакций and the severity of the uh, uh, inflammation complications. What's the time? Depending on the acuity of inflammation or degree of in, in inflammation of the liquoria. Uh, so does the time uh, tell on the tactics that you use? The time to close the uh, CSF leakage. Uh, ask, ask again. Is it important the acuity of inflammation reactions when you have a CSF leakage in uh, and does it tell on the time of the reconstruction, on the duration of the reconstruction? The severity of the inflammation, does it tell on the time of repeated reconstruction operations? We have very rare in, in, uh, problems with infection. It's, it's a very low rate. We had uh, one patient with a brain abscess, after we made a transcript reform approach, what I told you, because everything fall into the brain. And then, of course, when we saw on the postal MRI that our reconstruction was gone, we repeated it, we removed it, and we put another layer of fat and glue immediately, because we saw that the reconstruction is not in place. If you have an infection and meningitis, but your post-op MRI shows that the nasal flap is in good position, then you just take um, a CSF from the lumbar drain to check what bacteria are inside and then we make our antibiotic treatment according to the resistogram. So if you have problems and you see the, 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 um, the construction is not okay, it doesn't matter whether there's inflammation or not. If you see CSF is coming, immediately you have to treat it to prevent infection. But the rate of infection is really very low. Even if you open up and make an extended approach and open the dura, it's very low rate of infection. And we give only once uh, antibiotic prophylaxis. With induction of anesthesia, we usually give cefuroxime, single shot antibiotic prophylaxis. If we have tamponades on both sides, then we give for that time antibiotics. Because then you have a stasis of the mucus, nothing can come out. This we do, but in the normal cases, between two cases, single shot. No, we fix it. No fat, no fat, no, no. We make we make a snowball and a snowman fat. So a small piece is inside the defect, and a bigger piece stays outside the skull base, so it cannot fall. Then we fix it with glue. Oh. And if you see, initially, is a big piece of fat, and after three months, you make an MRI, you see 
it shrinks down. Sometimes we fill the sphenoid sinus just with fat. We do not cover it. And after three months, almost all fat is gone. The problem with the fat, the only problem, in my opinion, is that some patients, they have really a problem because of the bad smell. There's a decay of the fat. And exactly, yes. Exactly. That's why we tried to put this plate on. But we had cases, formerly, we just put fat. And then some patients have no problem. But some patients have a really bad smell, and especially the partner is complaining. Because, no, don't, don't come too close to me. <laughs> because of the bad smell. That is the problem with the fat. But if this fat is going in the CSF, I think it's no problem. So I think now we are ready with the lectures and want to go to the laboratory. But I, first I want to show you a video showing our approach to the pituitary uh, gland. And this is the first step what we want to do in the cadaver workshop. And that's why before we start, I think we show, I show you the video that you understand what we want to do. And this is what we do then in the cadaver lab. It's a standard approach to the pituitary gland. This looks strange. One moment. <laughs> it was not warm. <laughs> so this is our, our technique, how we do it. The first, you make an inspection. We have a suction irrigation device, what we use first. You go into the nose. This is the right nostril. You see the septum. You see the coana, the lower turbinate, middle turbinate. Then we go to the other side. See, septum. Lower turbinate, middle turbinate, koana. These are the main landmarks which we should identify before we do anything. So then we have patties soaked in with epinephrine one by thousand. And these are played in between, placed in between the septum and the turbinates to get some space. You see, this is a dissector. So we lateralize the middle turbinate. It's very important to get space. So you push the inferior turbinate to the side, you push the middle turbinate to the side, you push the superior turbinate to the side. Then we do it on the other side as well. You go in, the lateralization of the inferior turbinate of the middle turbinate. Sometimes the inferior turbinate is very, very um, strong and we have to fracture it. Then we identify here, this is the, this is superior turbinate, this is the septum, this is sphenoidmoid recess. So you have to push the superior turbinate a little bit laterally. And then usually you see the ostium. Not in all cases, but frequently seen. The distance from the coana to the ostium is about 1.5 centimeters. It can be a little bit more, a little bit less. This is a monopolar suction. You see the tip has monopolar electrodes, so you can coagulate it. This is the area where the supply comes from the flap. So if you want to raise a flap, you cannot do it. But if you make a stand pituitary case, we just coagulate the mucosa in this area and in the posterior part of the septum. You see the ostium is now widely open. Then we go to the other side, the same thing, identification of the sphenoid ostium. This is superior turbinate here. And we coagulate mucosa in front of the anterior wall of the sphenoid sinus and then the posterior part of the septum. Then you can fracture. Nowadays we fracture first the septum, but you can also take simply a drill and you start to drill. You need irrigation for that to, to keep the lens clean. And then you expose the rostrum. You see this is the rostrum of the sphenoid sign. If you see that, you know it's the right way to go. But you see the posterior septum is in my way. It's always disturbing me. And that's why this posterior part of the septum has to be removed. So we can take a kerosene. 
remove septum to get better access. And this amount of removal depends, of course, where you want to go. This is a backbiter. It's a very nice instrument to take the posterior part of the septum away. See, you, in, you ins, insert it on the collateral side, and then you see the biting. And we open the sinus more, and here is an artery which is in, in very close to us. This is a posterior. You see here the posterior branches, the nasal septum, branch of the sphenopatian artery, and this must be coagulated very well. We had some patients who came after 10 days with massive nasal hemorrhage, probably from these arteries. So you have to coagulate it very, very precisely. Then we have to open the anterior wall more upwards to get access to the upper part. But we should avoid taking the super turbinates. And then see, you see now the anatomy, left optic nerve, lateral OCR, carotid. This is a bulging of the cellar floor because of the tumor pressure. And you see the septum here. So it's optic nerve left. This is the clinical carotid, cavernous carotid, goes down. And here you see the clivus, so clival carotid. Other side, optic nerve, lateral OCR, clinoidal carotid, cavernous carotid, and the clival carotid. And then, as I told you, the crossing depends from the amount of bone which is exposed to air. So we just take the mucosa here on the cellar floor. We don't strip the mucosa from the whole sphenoid sign. It's very important that you have a good outcome in terms of nasal quality. So we just remove the mucosa from the cellar floor. And you see we make a uh, forehand technique, so we have not a holding device holding the scope, but in a system is holding it, and so we have a dynamic endoscopic visualization. So we move the septum, and then we use a high speed drill to open the cellar. So this is the step what I want you to do in the lab now. It's a standard approach to the, to the cellar area. You see the bone is very thin in tumor cases frequently because of the chronic pressure. Then we remove the bone to expose the cellar. Some more forceps. Take all the bone part out, make the nasopharynx clean, that the patient does not need to cough too much. Because if you have a serious affliction and you have a reconstruction and the patient is coughing, the pressure goes very high up, and this may also endanger your reconstruction. Kerosene can be used to widen the cellar opening, and then we, we take a blade, a retractable blade, and then we cut it. So there's a different kind, different ways to cut it. You can make it cruciform, you can make it round and take the whole piece out. What we do now frequently, that is not disturbing that the dura is in your way. So anyhow, we never close the dura, so you can really shrink it. See, tumor comes out. If you're lucky, you have a tumor like this. Fortunately, most of the pituitary tumors are very soft and then it's easy to resect them. We take a lot of biopsies for histological evaluation, then some curettes. I like to have the sharp curettes. There are some people, they have only the blunt curettes, but I think with the sharp curettes, uh, I, I think it's a better resection. It's very important, if you start with the resection of the tumors, you first take the, the lower part of the tumor. Then you go, to the, you go to the side, left and right, but don't take the upper part first because then the diaphragma falls down and is always in your way of the dissection. So first you resect the tumor in the lower part and then you go to the, to the sides and then the last piece is in the upper part of the tumor. I think it's very important that we have bimanual technique not just in one hand, the endoscope, and the other hand, uh, uh, suction. See, this is a dura already here coming. Here is the diaphragma coming. And this is a problem here. There is a folding between the dorsal dura and the diaphragma. And you have to elevate it. Otherwise, you can miss tumor in this folding behind. And you see here, this yellow thing is normal gland. So I elevate it, and you see there's more tumor. And with the endoscope, you can really go into the cavity 
You see here in this folding area, there's no tumor left. So you have a very good control, even if you only use a zero degree endoscope. If you have tumor which goes more laterally, we use 30 degree endoscope, 45 degree endoscope. Then we take a little bit, a small patty to protect the diaphragma and then we elevate again to get access behind the diaphragma and we can remove more tumor here. So we, now we have a 30 degree endoscope, look up, there's no remnant in between the diaphragma cella and the drosom cellae. This is our dura, and you see the yellow thing on the diaphragma is a normal gland. Then we put some gel foam to fill the cavity, but you see the diaphragm must always try to push, uh, to, to push it out. And then we have this resorbable plate and we place it, usually we place it under the bone. If it's not possible, you can also place it intradurally, but if possible, we place it just epidurally. And that's it. Then important is, Last step is that you again uh, medialize the middle turbinate to keep the ostium free. Once makes a sinus that you have no problem with the outflow of the mucus from the pranasal sinuses. You see again medialization of the middle turbinates. And then we don't use any package. So this is the, the standard procedure which we want to show you now in the lab. I think we make first coffee break and then we go down. All right, thank you. Спасибо за сообщение.